co-host, Dr. Rachel Palier, and our rapporteur, Dr. Romel Solabo. I will be introducing them a little bit more later on. But before I present the first speaker, I would like to remind our viewers of the following. Here are some guidelines for the Q&A portion. Type your questions in the Q&A chat toolbox. Refrain from asking similar questions. Upvote your questions. You wish to be answered by hitting the like button in the Zoom and Q&A chat box. And if you wish to take a live, to ask a live question, just click raise hand and wait for the moderator to entertain you. Today, I am greatly honored and privileged to host this session as we have an excellent lineup of um, speakers who are multi-awarded scientists and trailblazers in their field of expertise. Our first invited lecturer is Dr. Jane Leach, a university distinguished professor and associate dean for research, College of Agriculture at the Colorado State University, USA. Dr. Leach is a plant pathologist. She is the current president of the International Society of Plant Pathology. She is a fellow and past president of the American Phytopathological Society, or APS. Dr. Leach served on the APS Public Policy Board for 16 years, leading advocacy efforts such as Phytobiomes Initiative, a systems level approach to improving crop productivity. Dr. Leach is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. She is a member of the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In May 2019, Dr. Leach was awarded the Agropolis Fondation Louis Malassi International Scientific Prize for Agriculture and Food for Distinguished Scientists. This coming August 2020, she will be presented the past president of the American Phytopathological Society Award of Distinction. Dr. Leach. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Nina. I'll show my screen. Are we good? Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> So thanks for the invitation to speak in this exciting session and I'm in and I'm and I'm very honored to participate in the session with a number of distinguished scientists today. Today I'd like to talk to you and discuss one of the great challenges for agriculture and agricultural researchers and that is the impacts of the changing climate on plant disease and how that affects crops in, in crop production. With some difficulties here. Major storms have always devastated farms worldwide, whether from damaging winds during a storm or erosion or landslides. But now, as many of you know, they're becoming more and more common. In the spring of 2018, for example, unusually heavy rains and snowstorms caused massive flooding in the U.S. Midwest. The flooding inundated thousands of farm acres and farmers couldn't get into their fields to plant their crops. Thousands of livestock animals were killed impact, and it, it not only impacted um, the farming systems, but those who depended on the farming system. These floods in the Midwest caused the losses of Midwestern farmers over $400 million in cattle and $440 million in crop species in one season alone. On the opposite extreme, drought is looming in many areas of the world and the lack of adequate water damages or destroys crops, dries up soils and threatens our livelihoods. Between 2014 and 2016, for example, in the state of California, 
an estimated $3.8 billion of direct statewide economic losses occurred due to drought. Drought and other climate change related conditions are exacerbating degradation of soils. It is truly frightening to me and I, I'm sure to you that 1.5 billion people already depend on degraded soils for survival and it's only gonna get worse. Growing seasons are starting earlier and getting hotter in the warming climates. And to us, we might think that a, a, an earlier growing season might be a good thing uh, in the short term. But, uh, but, they, but in the long term, the problems are that you may have increases in pest populations and more generations per year. Or early spring onset can result in uh, crops growing before they have the nu nutrients or the soil moisture that will help them to grow. Or it can ruin fruit crops if the spring um, uh, has late frosts. Increasing temperatures are fueling wildfires that are devastating farms around the world. This is an example in the US where ranchers in the West are experiencing major losses as a result of worsening fire seasons. These can not only come from charred grazing lands, but loss of life and decimated hay stocks. The picture for agriculture's future is pretty bleak. The International Panel on Climate Change warned us in 2007 already that warming in the climate system is unequivocal. And in 2018, they reported that warming is happening faster and earlier than they had previously predicted. The predictions are that yields for key crops, the crops that feed the world, such as wheat, rice, maize, and soybean, will be negatively affected by only 1% or by only one degree temperature increases. And we're already observing those one degree increases around the world. For rice, the negative impacts of increasing temperatures in the environment are not just predictions. They have been documented. We're seeing increased nighttime temperatures that are not only reducing yields, but as those yields decline, we're seeing increases in release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from the rice paddies. There are a lot of models um, that are out there being designed to predict what might happen and what we should do to manage it in these changing climate conditions as the temperatures incline. But until recently, there were lots of models and hypotheses but the empirical data that tells us what we might need to do helps guide our responses is only just becoming available. Why is this? It's because studying the interactions of crop plants with the environment, which includes weather and the soil and other factors, as well as the complication of other biological and non-biological factors such as insects, um, microbes in the soil, on the plants, other weed species con uh, competing with the plants. The system is complex and we call this system, which is the interactions of the environment with the living organisms that influence or are influenced by plants, the phytobiome. And to study this phytobiome, we can't just focus on one element at a time. We need to use a systems approach. So we need to embrace the complexity of the phytobiome. Because of the difficulty of studying these complex systems, plant pathologists or entomologists typically study the interaction of one organism, like a fungus and the plant, or a bacteria or an insect in a plant, and one crop, rice, wheat, whatever. They rarely uh, include the impact of the weather on the system or the type of the soil and how that impacts that interaction or the moisture in the soil. We need to think about this thing as a system if we're going to solve the problems that are facing us in the future. In the past 10 years, 
um, we've seen a number of advances that will help us solve these complicated problems. We've seen advances in systems level approaches uh, that will enable us to uh, characterize the environment and the uh, uh, biological and abiological, abiotic or, uh, components of that environment. We've seen the ability to handle large amounts of data that will enable us to combine the impacts of soil, the impacts of pathogens, the impacts of the weather on our systems. And in uh, microbiome discoveries, not only in the human, but the plant and ecological systems have shown us that there are patterns that we can look at and tease out if we look at enough data associated with those. We know that we need to do large longitudinal studies rather than just cross-sectional studies. And we also need to understand that there may be unexpected impacts on the host based on what we're seeing with microbiome interactions with host or human diseases and uh, humans. And also importantly, we're seeing that we can translate these, um, these this information that we're gaining to treatments. For example, you hear probiotics or fecal transplants in human systems. In agriculture, we've seen huge advance, advances in precision ag where you can apply the right amount of a, of, a, a, of a fertilizer at the right site at the right time without spreading it throughout the field. And also decision support systems that help us predict what the impacts of, of these system, these in, uh, uh, environmental factors will be. It's important for us to understand that when we're looking at a phytobiome, the predicted effects of an increased temperature on the plant or the, uh, can be not only on the plant, or, but they can also be on the pathogen. And there are a number of things that we can measure to determine what those factors are, but we need to take all of this into account. Um, we, in, in my laboratory, we're interested in understanding what's happening at the disease system in an increasing temperature. And from a plant disease perspective, there's a simple reason why we need to study this as a system, or at least combinations of stresses on plants. It's because the outcome may not be what we predicted. For example, we may incorporate heat tolerance into a crop, or we may incorporate disease resistance into a crop. But a plant in a field is exposed to multiple stresses, and it can be exposed to heat and pathogen stress at the same time. And the unfortunate thing is that the outcome may not be what we predicted. For example, we may have spent years incorporating disease resistance into crop species only to have that resistance fail if the environment changes. Today, I'd like to talk to you about my favorite plant and host system, which is um, rice and the bacterial blight pathogen, uh, which is the, the disease, a devastating disease that's found in rice production areas throughout uh, Asia. And I'll use this as an example to, uh, of how looking at the system might help us understand better how to control this disease. Now in rice, most of you know that um, our sources of, of resistance to bacterial blight are single resistance genes. And the breeders will work for 10 to 15 years to intergress resistance genes into rice. I don't have to, um, I, I don't ha have to assume that you're plant pathologists to know that the left side of the screen is healthy rice and the left, I'm sorry, the right side of the screen is diseased rice. And the left side of the screen is healthy because there are single genes that have been introduced into that plant. Bacterial blight pressure has been known for some time to be worse at high, in higher environmental temperatures. Um, it's been known since for in Japan, there were many studies that, should dis, uh, that demonstrated 
that the disease increases under increasing environmental under high temperatures in the environment. And this is exacerbated if the season is humid. The disease just goes rampant. And we can also replicate that in greenhouse and screenhouse conditions, which makes it a very nice system to study. I'll point out that when I talk about high temperature regimes, they're not that high. These are the average temperatures in the hot season in the Philippines, the day-night temperatures. And the blue or the cool temperatures, like, which I'm calling low temperatures, are 29 day and 21 night, which are more of uh, the typical season, the cool season temperatures. But we know that there's increased disease at high temperatures, but what it we don't really know, and we didn't really know how high temperatures would affect resistance to bacterial blight. So a few years back, um, we and our collaborators at the International Rice Research Institute looked at the responses of a number of rice bacterial blight disease resistance genes to combined stresses of high temperatures um, and bacterial blight. Most of the resistance genes lost efficacy at high temperatures. So the red is the high temperature, the blue is the low temperature. And so for example, the XA4 gene, which is a widely deployed gene in Asia, resistance gene for bacterial blight that's deployed throughout Asia, almost lost efficacy at high temperatures. Whereas um, the interesting thing is that, and, and most other resistance genes that we looked at also lost efficacy. The interesting gene is this unusual, uh, exceptional gene called XA7. And it shows the opposite trend. At high temperatures, XA7 is more um, effective at controlling disease than at the low temperatures. It's a good resistance gene no matter what, but it's even better at high temperatures. So why do we care about that? We care about that because if XA7 confers higher levels, it may be a very useful resistance gene for us to incorporate into germplasm in areas of high temperature. And second, because if we can figure out why plants with XA7 are more resistant to high temperatures, we can also, we then might be able to develop strategies for improving rice to meet the demands of the future. So as I mentioned before, we're interested in looking at um, exploring both why resistance, why rice is more susceptible to disease at high temperatures and why some resistance genes like XA7 are more effective at high temperatures. As I indicated earlier, um, increasing temperatures may impact the host or the pathogen or both. So we've asked if high temperatures increase disease by increase, encouraging elevated populations of the pathogens. In a paper that was recently published from Nolly Veracruz's lab, uh, uh, her student Sylvester Dosa demonstrated that at high temperatures, as I mentioned earlier, there, are there is more disease or longer lesions on rice uh, than at low temperatures. What they did is they sectioned the plant from the inoculation site down to the leading edge of the lesion. And at low temperatures where the lesions had not progressed into this part of the leaf, they saw lower populations of bacteria. However, in the high temperature where the lesions had gone beyond uh, 10 centimeters up to about 14 centimeters, they saw that the populations of the bacteria remained hot. Oops, sorry, back. I gotta go back. Uh, remained, were high relative to the, that same section in the low. The bacteria had spread further, but, um, in, and that the, the, those numbers in that distal portion contained higher amounts of bacteria, but overall, uh, we don't know from this if the bacteria are multiplying to higher, uh, faster or to higher, faster in these leaves. 
So we uh, conducted some multiplication assays of the bacteria in the laboratory. And you can see very clearly that as the, as the temperature increases, bacterial multiplication decreases considerably. So this is at 35 degrees C. Well, we know this is in contrast to what you might expect given you see the increased spread of the bacteria and leaves at high temperature. So um, it's possible that the plant, uh, the temperature at the plant surface is lower than um, the environmental temperature. And of course, uh, Nolly's group at Erie has shown that this is true, that the bacterial temperature or the plant temperature on the surface of the leaves is about two to three degrees less than the environmental temperature. But overall, even taking that into account, um, increased disease at high temperature is not likely due to increased pathogen multiplication because we, we would still be in a zone where the bacteria would be inhibited. So given that, we turned our focus to the impacts on the host. We looked at gene expression patterns in plants undergoing heat and disease stresses individually or in combination to understand the impacts of, of high temperature on plant resistance responses and what happened in those in to the plant in the increased temperature stress responses. So Stephen Cohen, the student who performed this work, was asking two questions. Why are plants more susceptible to bacterial blight at high temperatures? And why are some resistance genes like XA7 more effective at those high temperatures? So he inoculated the plants and incubated them at high and low temperatures, performed an, a transcriptome analysis on the tissues that had been infiltrated with the bacteria, and then asked what genes and pathways are differently regulated by these two, di two different stress conditions. Now, I'm going to uh, just very briefly summarize what he found, because what I really want you to understand is how the, how, how the impact of one, one, the impact on plants of one stress condition can give one response. But when you add a second stress, you get very different responses. So what he found, and this is a way of looking at gene expression, these are genes uh, in, this, in this kernel plot that are ABA biosynthetic or responsive genes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about ABA in the next slide. But what I want you to notice is that if the plants were only treated with uh, uh, incubated at high temperature relative to low temperature, no, no pathogen present, we saw an increase in the uh, biosynthetic, the ABA biosynthetic and responsive gene expression. If the plants were incubated at high temperature and then treated with a, a, a pathogen that would lead to a susceptible interaction or disease, we saw even uh, more activation of ABA biosynthetic and responsive genes. So high temperature plus pathogen leads to higher ABA responses, ABA being uh, highly upregulated by heat. Interestingly, that very unique resistance gene XA7, when we inoculate plants that then would result in a resistant interaction at high temperature relative to normal temperature, the ABA biosynthetic and responsive genes are um, inhibited and inhibited to a large extent. So ABA is a, a plant hormone, epsisic acid is a plant hormone that is important for heat tolerance. So in, in heat tolerant, heat is an abiotic stress. And if you uh, have activation of ABA, you have adaptation to that heat stress and other abiotic stresses such as cold and drought and salt. Interestingly, ABA blocks resistance to pathogens. So it makes the plants more susceptible to disease by blocking resistance. And in fact, it has 
been shown that if you add ABA um, to uh, rice plants, you see increased bacterial blight disease. So overall, what we're showing is that our hypothesis resulting from these studies is that during high temperature stress or heat and pathogen attack disease, rice favors the abiotic uh, ab abiotic stress response pathway, you see the activation of ABA, so abiotic stress response. But if you add the XA7 resistance gene, we hypothesize that XA7 is more effective at controlling disease at high temperatures because it suppresses the abiotic defense response pathway, the, the ABA pathway, which in fact then allows the plant to resist the pathogens. So why do we care? Why is this important? Well, for one thing, knowing that at high temperatures we activate ABA, which causes increased disease because it blocks resistance, and at high temperatures, if we have ABA in the presence of XA7, we, blo we, act, we block activation of ABA and therefore get resistance. What this tells us is that we may be able to use this to identify other sources of resistance or um, identify pathways that will bypass the ABA responses and make uh, plants more durable and effectively resistant at high temperatures. It also will help facilitate planning and breeding for sustainable crop production under conditions of increasing global temperatures. For example, what we really wanna do is avoid making mistakes. We want to, um, if, and what I mean is that there may be a risk of enhance, if, that if we enhance heat tolerance by activating ABA, we may make plants more resistant and more susceptible to disease by blocking resistance. On the other hand, if we mimic XA7 mechanism for resistance, we may render the plants more susceptible to disease because we may, um, may, may be more susceptible to heat stress, I mean, because we're, we are now blocking the production of ABA. So we have to be careful. We have to think about what's going to happen if we try to uh, mo uh, modulate with these combined stresses. So the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is that phytobiomes are complex systems. And in a changing climate, understanding the interactions of the components of this phytobiome is critical to sustainable crop health. So I hope I've convinced you that it's important to look at the complexity of the system and to think about what we're doing if we mod modify one part of that system without paying attention to the other parts of the system. And with that, I'd like to thank our many collaborators, uh, many from the Philippines, in fact, and uh, from around the world, and also to thank our many funding agencies. And also, again, thank you very much for your attention and for having me at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leach.